I'm Shah Ali, Chairman of Manhattan Community Board 12. According to the Small Business Congress last year, at least 1,200 small businesses closed per month in New York City, leaving a huge number of stores available for rent in Manhattan. My question is, why are these shops staying unpopulated? Have high rents and Amazon finally killed the local mom-and-pop store? Or in general, are there less people opening retail stores in New York City? Or maybe it's the landlords. Are they rejecting the independent business owner in favor of deep pocket franchises? Are they hoarding properties hoping for a big box payout? We reached out to a few people to get their take on this small business crisis. Take a look. New York is a very expensive place. If you can pull off a business here, it's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and stay afloat. When I first started looking for stores in the East Village, uh, I could find a storefront for 2,500 bucks. Now that's just not gonna happen. My landlord had multiple empty storefronts. I kept trying to rent them. And then I would try to rent other spaces in the neighborhood to move to and no one wanted to rent them. And, or they were so high, like unbelievable, like you would laugh at them. One of the challenges for, for new entrepreneurs right now is just the fact that we have such an out of control real estate market that rents are constantly going up. And as a result of the fact that rents are constantly going up, it's harder and harder to get a lease for an extended period of time like a storefront that was literally maybe worth $5,000 a month, they were asking $12,000 a month for. And, I, and I'm like, you're not gonna get that. They're like, yeah, we'll, we'll wait, who cares? We don't, we don't care. And I'm like, why are people doing this? So one of the challenges has to do with vacant storefronts is the fact, just very simply, that there is no penalty in place for a landlord to just sit on a vacant commercial property. And so what ends up happening is you see across the city different stages of this, but this really insidious cycle of tenants being harassed, tenants being displaced, tenants being replaced basically with just an, a vacant storefront, which can sit there for months, years, decades, and no penalty is put in place until, you know, the, the speculation and the gentrification pressures reach that neighborhood, and then you're renting out the space to a chain retailer or a Dwayne Reed or a big bank. And even when we've tried to look at this issue more broadly on a citywide scale of what is, how bad is commercial vacancy as an issue, there's no information about it. There's no tracking of it. The fact that we don't have any broader data that explicitly says, here is how much commercial vacancy there is in the city is just a huge problem. The fact that there's a lot of vacant stores uh, in Manhattan is a concern to us as the agency and as I, actually as administration. We really want to figure out ways uh, to really address that issue and whether it's a registry where the landlord has to register that the storefront is vacant. Uh, so that way we have better data. Owning a building 10 years ago was totally different. The areas change and it pushes the small mom and pop diners and delis and things like that out. Uh, they're making a way for the big developers, the big name stores and the big commercial stores to come in and pay the seven, ten thousand and twelve thousand dollar a month rent. And that runs the small unit owners out. Who are the good landlords and who are the bad landlords? The landlords who aren't warehousing properties, who aren't just sitting on spaces for years, if not decades at a time, we need to do something about that. But the, the landlords who are engaged in the community, who aren't absent, we want them to also be part of the solution as well. We certainly will want to work with council uh, to figure out the best solution, uh, not only to help the smaller landlords, but also to address the absentee landlords. And those are the landlords that we really want to figure out how we can address that through a penalty uh, because they're not here in the city. Uh, they're somewhere else, they're not really paying attention to their property, and they don't really understand the negative impact. We're lucky in that we are in this moment as a city that we recognize this is a problem, we need to do something about it, so now it's just a matter of having the political will to actually push through solutions to address those problems, but ultimately to empower tenants, both on the residential side and the commercial side, to have the protections that they need to stay in their neighborhoods and thrive.
Public policy changes will help. There is still a need to have the local boutiques and the small unit owners. And if these changes can benefit, will it make a change in the community in the area with the small landlords? Will they be able to sustain? I believe it will help a lot. Uh, a city as, as large as New York and as vibrant as New York, ideally we want to see businesses uh, that reflect the diversity of New York City. And we want to see those small businesses actually adapt uh, to the new technology um, and really connect uh, to their communities uh, in different ways. To discuss these issues from a legislative point of view, I'm joined by State Senator Brian Benjamin. The senator covers the 30th Senatorial District in New York State. Hello, Senator. Hi, how are you, Shah? Good, thank you. Thank you for being here today. Oh, no, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You are, I would say, an expert in the field we're about to, to discuss from your days on Community Board 10, Absolutely. from your days as the chairman of Community yeah, Board 10, to right. now as a uh, state senator. And the issue is this. Uh, small businesses, sure. struggling businesses, store vacancies, and the increasing amount of vacant stores throughout uh, the city mm -hmm. and throughout your district. Now you have a unique perspective. You represent the Upper West Side, mm -hmm. a good portion of Harlem, mm -hmm. and my, por portions of my district, uh, Washington Heights. Can you tell us what are you seeing? You know, it's interesting, when I was running for office, the, one of the things that shocked me the most is that my entire district was dealing with this very issue. I was shocked to see on the Upper West Side there are a number of vacant uh, commercial lots. And I was saying, it's the Upper West Side. You figure it would be easy to, uh, to, to, to have, not have these vacancies. But one of the issues that we have is the costs are growing uh, uh, tremendously. And you know, we have done a, a very strong job of f pushing back on residential gentrification, if you will, but there's almost been no efforts around commercial gentrification, which is what's happening. Uh, when you look up, when I say north of 59th Street, it's really residential, right? Um, and you want to have commercial um, uh, uh, businesses that represent the needs of residential living, uh, not necessarily can, that can pay the downtown prices, if you will. And so there's this, there's this rub that we have, to, we have to fix. And quite frankly, in, in, in the entire parts of the district, I know of some great neighborhood stores, businesses that just can't afford the rent, that are part of the culture and the character that is making people want to live there, but those businesses can't afford to stay. So what do you do? Some of the things that we've been talking about is trying to have something similar, you know, how we have, uh, we have sort of rent control um, for resident, residential um, units, trying to f see what we can do for, on the commercial side. Uh, that is obviously being pushed. Uh, we have some people pushing back against that, as you can imagine, particularly uh, some of the landlords are not interested in that. Uh, but we do need to have some sort of thought process around how we do that. How do we provide some supports uh, for some of our um, small businesses who, you know, maybe can't afford the rent, but maybe they can afford something and we can kind of uh, be a, a gap filler? I mean, we have to be creative on this. Um, it, has, it doesn't get as much attention because you don't have thousands of people protesting outside saying, protect our rents. Um, these are uh, in most cases, businesses that would need to come in, so they're not there yet, and or some small shops that are getting pushed out, but they don't, they're not really politically mobilized in that way. So there's got to be some efforts around political mobilization to sort of really try to drive this home. Uh, but you know, our behind our President Gail Brewer, when I was on the chair of Community Board 12, she's she, I'm Community Board 10. I'm sorry, uh, we, she's been very focused on this, and you know, it's just something that we've got to do as a community together. Uh, but it's something that we need to focus on. You mentioned something that I want to talk to you about. Um, the, there's no dispute that there's vacancies and stores are closing. Right. But do you see in your district, because we see it in Upper Manhattan, sure. that it's more small businesses, the mom and pop stores, if you will, that are closing versus the big chain stores oh, that absolutely. can absorb oh, yes, a rent yeah, increase. Yeah. Oh, like no, a no, 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 no. It's, it's, and and they're, they're, you know, they're being, our small businesses are the ones that are closing to make way for um, you know, more high, you know, high luxury restaurant, you know, uh, the people can pay. Restaurants can pay more than, you know, some of our small mom and pop shop businesses and obviously some of the big box stores. And there's efforts to, in the case of Lenox Terrace, for example, the, uh, the owners want to basically rezone, uh, you know, that entire strip 
to have even bigger box uh, a retail that's not permissible now. So um, it's really an, an, an issue. A lot of it has to do with some of our city elected officials, um, and I obviously play a role being being helpful. But you know, we've got to have penalties on those who just keep you know uh, 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 commercial spots vacant for extended periods of time. I mean, it's a, it's an eyesore, but also it doesn't allow for some very important um, small businesses that should be there that provide real real uh, benefits to the community. It is definitely an issue right. um, and it's that's a concern and that's why I'm saying a lot of our some of our small mom and pops aren't politically organized in a way to sort of help force our hands to move to try to prevent to prevent some of this stuff almost like you almost need uh, landmarking in some cases like some some uh, mom and pop shores are so important to the character of a neighborhood they almost should be landmarked which then which then can have the implications of, of stopping them from being moved you mentioned two good things that could be proactive measures to help small business that is commercial rent protection yes uh, akin to residential I, and you yeah, also uh, talked about uh, commercial uh, vacancy tax that is yes. if, if, if a landlord is incentivized to keeping a store vacant, that yeah. they should be taxed for it, and it should, and, it, and the tax should grow over time to to add even increasing pressure because it will force them to compromise. I mean, what's probably happening in some of these cases is that you're waiting for the ideal tenant. You don't want to bring in a tenant and give them a 10, 15 year lease, and then uh, you know, to, at some price that you wouldn't prefer. You rather just keep it vacant and wait till you can find the right person because you know the market is moving in a way that you prefer. So, that's something that. We should add to the equation to say, well, wait a second. Well, you also have this huge tax that's going to continue to grow on you as well. You know what? Do the right thing and, and bring in um, and not push out uh, a, 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 a small mom and pop business when you don't have someone to put in. And also, um, you know, let's you know, you should bring that in. And also, what we can do is say, listen, landlord. Um, if you bring in a, a, a mom and pop store that really can add to the culture um, and character of the neighborhood, there's a benefit we can give you, and that's something that can be worked out as well. It doesn't have to be just confrontational. It could be something that says, let's figure out a solution that helps to make sure that, you know, in residential neighborhoods, that you have the right mix of, of businesses that can serve the community. There's two things I want to talk to you about. Uh, first uh, is uh, something I know you have pushed for, and I would like you to, to speak to the viewers about this, sure. uh, regarding rezoning and changing what's permissible in terms of commercial use. Uh, you've pushed for, advocated for smaller designated stores versus these larger footprints where, like, say, a bank would come in. Yeah. What, what's, the, what's, what's, the, what's the thought behind that? The thought behind that is my ultimate philosophy is that once you get past 59th Street, it's a residential neighborhood. Um, and what I don't want to have is uh, uptown looking like downtown. And I believe that you, in order to do that, you have to uh, create incentives for small businesses to be there because otherwise it's very hard. It's very hard for a small re uh, 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 grocer to deal with Walmart, right? If Walmart is selling, you know, a cup for five dollars and you're selling it for ten dollars, it's just hard to compete because people are going to go to Walmart. So we need to say, listen, let's figure out ways where uh, uh, the, the 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 small mom and pops can exist, and the bigger stores can exist, and it's and it's something that has more character and it's not just turning uptown into a commercial zone. Right. And the second thing, if you can give us your best 120 second uh, explanation on this, there are collateral effects that, yeah. that, that affect commercial businesses and that is when neighborhoods change yeah. or neighborhoods try to change. I, I, I know you were very vocal and ultimately successful sort of community and when I say community, all of New York, yeah. thanks you. Uh, there was a movement to rename uh, parts of Harlem oh, yes. for, for, for real estate. And then when that happens, there's, there's a ripple effect to commercializing. Uh, could you talk to us about that? Sure. One of the things that you know we had noticed was that there was a movement to rename from 110th to 125th Street South, uh, 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 South Harlem, a, a, a Soha. And the reason for it was that if you, if you kind of take Harlem out of the name characterization, it'll make it more attractive to certain uh, residential folks which and also to businesses. And as, as you can imagine, as the value value of the land continues to grow, you're able to charge more prices for commercial rent. And so one of the things that I was focused on is don't change the name of Harlem, which was about Harlem um, integrity and respect, but it was also about making sure that we don't lose the character and culture of Harlem, which is included in some of our small businesses, some of our restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. So I was happy to fight for that, and I, and I will continue to fight for our small businesses and our neighborhoods. Let me tell you, Harlem alone is a great name. I'm not sure why anyone would <laughs> want to change it. And I want to thank you for the work you've done, and thank you for your time here. I want to thank the senator for being here. We'll be right back. 
Joining me now is District Leader Ben Wetzler from the 76th Assembly District and small business owner Alex Tortellani. Thank you both for being here. Gentlemen, uh, we uh, just spoke to State Senator Brian Benjamin about the issue of small businesses, uh, commercial vacancies, and the struggles that uh, commercial businesses and small businesses are going through. And, and you both are uniquely familiar with that issue. The senator covers Washington Heights. His office covers Washington Heights, Harlem, uh, the Upper West Side. Ben, you are a district leader on the Upper East Side. And Alex, you own restaurants in uh, Tribeca, which is arguably one of the costliest areas to own a business, and also one in Harlem, which is also becoming one of the costliest areas to, to do business. Ben, I want to start with you. Tell us first, you are district leaders. Hey, if you can give us the best 90-second description, what is a district leader? Uh, so basically, I'm the elected Democratic Party leader for the uh, uh, a portion of the 76th Assembly District, which covers the Yorkville and Lenox Hill sections of the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. And so I'm responsible for all of the grassroots organizing uh, around progressive issues and uh, sort of motivating the base of the Democratic Party there. Right. One thing that the, is, uh, you know, a big transition that's happening in the neighborhood is that we just had the new subway along 2nd Avenue opened and uh, everyone was kind of excited that this was going to be a huge benefit to the businesses in the neighborhood, but I think a lot of them are finding that uh, there's kind of a, a bit of a, a, a time gap where more people are using the subway to go out of the neighborhood and patronize businesses in other places than are coming, using it to come into the neighborhood. And it's, uh, it's exacerbated this problem that's happening all over Manhattan where businesses are shutting down and then the, the landlords aren't filling them with new tenants. And my, uh, my colleague, the district leader for the other portion of the, uh, of the Upper East Side, and I wanted to, uh, to tackle this and we got everyone from Borough President Gail Brewer to local business, uh, our merchant association, business owners together and members of the community to try and figure out what we as citizens and as political activists can do about it. Right. So, so you've seen, uh, and, and this panel is, 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 is helpful because the senator covers a good portion of Upper Manhattan. Mm -hmm. uh, you cover the Upper East Side. Alex, you've seen, you have businesses up and and, and lower Manhattan. So this is not a, a, a neighborhood issue. This has been, as you called it, a citywide issue. Mm -hmm. What have you done uh, to, to one, recognize the issue, like, like sort of like spot the issue, mm -hmm. and, and what have you done to like sort of mobilize as, as, as a senator that organize uh, businesses? Well, uh, to recognize, you know, anybody who walks around on the Upper East Side uh, and really uh, any major commercial corridor in Manhattan, I think, uh, sees vacant storefronts that have been vacant, you know, restaurants or small shops that uh, uh, were shuttered because the tenant uh, who had been there couldn't pay the rent or they were planning to clear the block for a new development. We have a big uh, grocery store on 80 sec uh, 86th Street and 2nd Avenue where uh, it covered the entire block and now it's just empty because uh, the, now that the subway's open, the, uh, the landlord wants to bulldoze it and uh, erect a big skyscraper there. And so uh, one thing that we're trying to do is one, educate people on, uh, on why this happens because it is a somewhat bizarre phenomenon that a landlord would just take a loss on property for year, months or even years at a time rather than try and find a business to fill it and then come up with creative solutions. As the senator was talking about earlier, there are some tax issues, there are legislative issues, and then there are just community issues, getting uh, businesses together to talk about how they can uh, better market the neighborhood, how they can kind of encourage people to, to uh, shop locally, things like that. I think you're doing an excellent job at, at doing that. In fact, we've talked about and I've, I've praised that, that education and just getting the word out is enough to bring businesses together. Mm -hmm. right? And speaking of businesses, Alex, we've been talking about you in an indirect way. That is you being as a small business owner. You own Maxwell's on, on Reed Street in Lower Manhattan in Tribeca, which uh, I will say to all the viewers that it, it is the unofficial official meeting place <laughs> of, of, of Lower Manhattan. Uh, you've heard everyone talk about the struggles of small businesses, but from a business owner, what, what are the struggles that we, that we might know of? What are some of the struggles that we don't know about? Can you help us? Sure. At the top of everyone's list, um, you know, residential and commercial is rent. Uh, it's something we all have to deal with. Um, me and my partners make it a point to not get ourselves into rent situations that, um, you know, would put us over our head or anything. Um, so obviously, you know, the viewers kind of know about that, but some of the things that they might not know about is some of the bureaucracy that we deal with, with the city and state itself in terms of, you know, Department of Health, 
EPA, Department of Consumer Affairs, um, you know, all these people were subject to inspections and, you know, being in compliance with their rules and their rules were always changing. And normally when they come in for inspections or when they come to, to see us, that usually means a fine and some major repair that uh, has to go into it. And there's no rhyme or reason as to when they come. Um, it would just be, you know, a little bit better if they could work with us versus trying to, you know, come in and be more of an adversarial role and, you know, fine you and reprimand you. Um, you know, another issue we're dealing with is staff retention. Um, the type of business that I'm in and the salaries that are paid, um, it's hard for people to live in this city with the cost of living, um, what it is, and you know, work as a bartender full time or work as uh, a line cook full time. Um, and normally, you know, in the past, uh, you've been able to go to outer boroughs like Brooklyn and Queens and be able to find living there and, you know, a lower cost of living. And now those places are being, you know, developed and going into higher rents and, um, you know, people are just having to come from farther and farther out or, you know, just not interested in working in Manhattan at all anymore because of the headache and the cost of living. So, you know, we're dealing with that, finding other ways to incentivize people and keep them in staff retention. Um, you know, one of the, the last, you know, one of the major issues that we're dealing with too is kind of pass, you know, we're incurring all these costs, prices are going up, rents are going up, labor's going up. We need to somehow, you know, translate this to our customer and our prices and it's hard to justify a $25 cheeseburger to a customer. Um, that's expensive. That's expensive, <laughs> yeah. But you know, all of our other costs are going up so we right. have to, you know, that's, right. we sell food and drink so right. that, you know, so, so, not. So, so, so you're losing qualified employees, right? Yeah. Even with minimum weight being raised to a a, a higher level to meet certain basic needs. Yeah. You're saying that, that, that as a business owner, you're still losing qualified folks because they can't afford to live here. Absolutely. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I, for, fortunately, the, the minimum wage is being raised, and I think it's kind of been a long time coming, but, you know, that increase is not going along with the, uh, the cost of living increase in this city. And, you know, could we incur any more salary increases? I don't know. but. It's kind of a double-edged sword that you know the city's so expensive to live in, but we can't afford to pay these right. pay these people the type of salary that right. is conducive to living here. So, and could you help our viewers out? Because you know, I I gotta tell you, I was under until very recently this misconception that business owners, restaurant owners, are all wealthy owners <laughs> who who make millions a year off of maybe not twenty-five dollar cheeseburgers, but fifteen dollar cheeseburgers. Yeah. What is your what are your profit margins? Uh, keeping in mind that. Other businesses like supermarkets have razor thin profit margins. Sure. Restaurants open and close very quickly. At, at, at community boards, uh, businesses that want to, to serve alcohol have to come before us. So we see businesses open and close at a rapid rate. What's going on there? What, what, what should we know about that business profit side? You know, a good prime cost for a restaurant is uh, 25%, which means you know you're running out of 25% profitability. I don't know anybody right now that's kind of doing that with uh, with the way with the way things are going. But um, it's on the fact that you know people are under the impression that this is you know running a small business. People are making all this type of money. It's you have to be passionate about it. You know. Myself, my business partner, we both have other jobs. We own two restaurants, and I moonlight as a bartender two nights a week. He's with the FDNY, and that's what we do, you know, to get our insurance and everything else and things we can't get through our own small businesses. Mm -hmm. It's not a business where, you know, you open the doors and then I get keys to a house in the Hamptons. Right. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, it's got, you know, it's a seven day a week business. It's a seven day a week job. You have to be there every day. You have to be constantly on top of it. It's a grind. And, you know, you hope one day there will be a payoff, but if not, you know, it's what I'm passionate about. It's what I love doing. So I'd like to, you know, I'm going to continue doing it, right. you know, whether it's, uh, profitable or you know, I'm just spinning my wheels here. So, so, so Ben, a district leader, yeah. and, and I know you personally, this is something you do, but a district leader, you're probably the closest to the community as you get. Yeah, it's a oh, grassroots organizing right. role. Right, right. Maybe next to a community board, but, but you're probably mm -hmm. even more local. Mm -hmm. How does vacancies affect a neighborhood? And, 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 and the senator talked about organizing. I know you're yeah. doing a lot of organizing. Can you give us something on those two points? Uh, well. In terms of how it affects the neighborhood, I think anybody uh, it it hurts 
locals who ha you know th these business these empty stores uh, are eyesores. Uh, they add, detract from the street life as opposed to add from it, uh, add to it, um, and it hurts the other businesses in the neighborhood because they don't get the same kind of traffic that they get. As I was saying earlier, people uh, a lot of business owners in my neighborhood are concerned that the subway is taking customers away from them, and because this if you don't have a kind of density. Uh, of new businesses around, then people just stop thinking of it as a destination that they want to go to. Uh, part of what needs to happen is just changing that perception, which is, again, uh, a, a community building and educational thing. And then part of it, I think, there is, as this, uh, the senator was talking about, things that the city could do, legislative things, political things, uh, to help. When we organized this community forum to educate people and to hear their ideas, there was actually very mixed feelings about the idea of uh, commercial rent regulation or rent protection because uh, a lot of people were worried that that would actually exacerbate the empty storefronts that already existed. Landlords wouldn't be willing to, uh, to sign a new tenant if they knew they were being locked in uh, potentially indefinitely at this rent and they wouldn't be able to plan ahead. Uh, there was a lot more enthusiasm for things like shorter term leases so that pop-up shops could come, uh, things like that, which would add to the street life again. So Alex, if you had, if you had a wish list, right, a small business wish list, one or two of your top items, what do you think you would need? And we'll, we'll, we'll accept, say, like commercial rent protection as being, being one of them. What else would you ask for to help just a business, a solid, honest business, run well? You know, the senator touched on the landmarks doing landmarks for buildings and doing landmarks for businesses. It's crazy to me that good operators, good businesses that are loved by the community are being pushed out for no reason aside from a landlord, you know, or someone bought a building and now they want to get this, you know, X amount in rent uh, in order to make up for this astronomical amount they pay for the building. And that's, you know, the community suffers and the business owner suffers. Um, but obviously that's been touched on, you know, I. I'd like to see a little bit more support from the SBS in terms of um, they're good at the upfront helping you get your permits, going through the, the, the red tape of New York City of opening a business and going through all the licensing and whatnot. But in terms of like ongoing and you know how to run a business and day-to-day -day accounting and you know even like quick you know something as simple as QuickBooks classes that you know stuff that I had to learn on the fly that I think a lot of people don't really, you know, they have this dream, they have this passion, they want to get it open, but once they open the doors, it's like, all right, now what? You now, know? Now, now you have to be a business. Yeah, now you have right. to be a business person, right. you know, the creative parts, the yeah. fun parts over. So, so Ben, is that something as a district leader you think you could help a business out that is advocating for SBS services, which is a city, city yeah. service? Uh, for businesses. Yeah, I mean, uh, anybody who does any kind, who is involved in any kind of local grassroots, uh, you know, neighborhood organization or political organization should have a relationship with their business, with their local business owners and with their local elected officials and be able to connect them to the, you know, the, the city agencies and the other services that are available. And m m also, I think probably the best thing that people in the community can do is just kind of keep your eyes open and uh, See if there are businesses in your neighborhood that uh, you might not have been to before, but uh, could use the extra customers. As I always say, shop locally, yeah. shop and dine locally. This is a great conversation. Thank you both. Uh, but that is all the time uh, we have today. I want to thank my guests on the first panel, State Senator Brian Benjamin, uh, District Leader Ben Wexler, Small Business Owner Al Alex Turlani. Thank you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.